All right. Thank you very much for having me again. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to, to, to speak to the uh, to this uh, uh, crowd again. Um, hopefully, this time I'll be able to provide a little bit more information, uh, updated information. Um, I've got a lot of slides to go through, um, so I apologize ahead of time if I uh, speak a little bit quickly. Um, you know, I think this is recorded, so <laughs> if you need to go back and rewind or something to, to catch to catch some things that I may have gone over quickly, feel free to do so. All right, so let's just, just go ahead and jump right in. Um, my talk today is talking a little bit about the long, you know, longevity in the era of telemedicine. Um, all right, here we go. So um, I, I, my, the introduction was, was spot on, so I don't think I need to spend too much time on it. Um, uh, just a brief outline here. You want to talk a little bit about uh, telemedicine, you know, intro to telemedicine itself, intro to longevity, uh, what we're doing at Asia SRX, and how we're trying to build the uh, future of longevity. Um, now, I went into this a lot more detail in my last talk, so I'm not going to spend too much time on, on telemedicine regulation and things like that. Um, so, so if you're interested in learning more about you know, um, uh, I've, I've caught out about 20 slides for, you know, so I can, so I can add new material. So if you want to get more information about, about, you know, what is telemedicine and things like that, you know, feel free to uh, watch my uh, uh, talk from last year. Oh, I can't be, can't believe it's already been 12 months. I, time, time flies. Um, so basically telemedicine is basically any time where the doctor and the patient are not in the same room. Um, and, you know, it could be, uh, you know, any kind of monitoring, telephone, text, there's all sorts of technologies now. Um, you know, just like a lot of technologies we take uh, advantage of this, these days, um, it, it started with, uh, you know, space and military and government. Um, you know, NASA part partnered up with, uh, you know, to provide uh, health care in rural areas. Uh, and then there was a lot more support by government. Uh, you know, radiologists embraced uh, telemedicine in the 80s to, to try to, um, you know, read, read uh, uh, x-rays and CT scans from, from afar. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years from that, and you have, you know, electronic clinical records, patient portals, you know, you have apps, you have all sorts of, all, all sorts of things, and, and it's, it's really a booming field. Um, now, prior to the pandemic, you know, telemedicine was growing, but growing steadily. Um, there was still a lot of resistance from, you know, some of the conventional medical communities, uh, some, some of the medical specialties, uh, but that all kind of faded away because the pandemic kind of forced, you um, physicians and healthcare providers to accept telemedicine. You either accept the telemedicine or you shut down because a lot of a lot of countries, a lot of states had stay at home orders uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, you know, those those uh, healthcare systems that couldn't adapt to telemedicine uh, found themselves um, without without any revenue, without any patients, no way to take care of their, uh, their, their patients. So you have services like Teladoc was up 150 uh, percent, you know, Q1 2020 versus 2021, Amwell 120 percent. Um, so, you know, these are, these are typical numbers you'll see. Some telemedicine companies, they started smaller and they grew quite a bit more relatively because Teladoc and Amo were big before the pandemic. So, uh, you know, take, to take a big company like Teladoc and have it experience, you know, 150% growth is, is quite substantial. Um, just really quick, I want to touch on um, the uh, types of telemedicine. You know, um, you've got, um, uh, you know, synchronous versus store and forward. These are types of modality. And then in terms of like the different delivery systems you have acute care versus disease specific um i guess also kind of in between here would be like primary care a, a, there's a lot more talk of uh, virtual primary care uh, a lot of companies getting into that as well uh, again started before the pandemic uh, but really took off afterwards um acute care we mentioned teledoc and amwell um and um, um mentioned Teladoc and Amwell, and, you know, these are these are kind of the giants in, in the telemedicine field. Um, I, I just wanted to touch quickly on um, disease-specific telemedicine. Um, the reason is because that's, well, even though we're not at Asia Star Arcs, we're not treating a disease per se, but we are kind of specific to a focus, which is longevity. Uh, however, there, there are a lot of um, uh, healthcare startups that have started up. Uh, for specific um, uh, uh, telemedicine, specific uh, disease conditions. Um, here's, here's some examples. You know, you've got, you know, the Pill Club for birth control, Brightside for mental health, you know, Verda for diabetes, Hims and Romans are competing for, um, uh, well, they, they originally started out competing for men's health, but of course they've got it to women's health as well. Um, and I think they're both trying to get into uh, vir you know, primary care. Uh, again, there's a big push for, for virtual primary care. Um, just to give you an idea of like the 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 uh, the, the, the 
speed of growth of the field as well as the the strength of the field you know uh hymns went public back in october at a 1.6 billion dollar valuation their stock i just checked this morning about 14 dollars a share um you know verta health uh they, they they focus specifically on diabetes um diabetes reversal uh they just raised a series e at a two billion dollar valuation and roman it's it's parent company Roe, which just acquired modern fertility um they're uh they're at a five billion dollar valuation so you know these are just this is just a small sampling of, of what's what what's going on out there in terms of the uh telemedicine landscape um again there's kind of a bridge version of what i gave last year so feel free to go back to to the to the, to the presentation last year for a little bit more in depth but basically the advantage of telemedicine you know potentially a lower cost you know reduced or even no wait time you know you don't have to drive to a clinic spend half an hour in the waiting room another half an hour waiting for the provider uh, and then drive back, uh, you know, some, some, you know, oftentimes in, in person care, you have to take a half a day or a full day off just just to just to make that one visit. And then not to mention the follow up testing and all the rest of that. Um, so so telemedicine can really help uh, streamline that. Um, and, you know, it enhances face to face healthcare. I don't think face to face healthcare is going to go away anytime soon. Uh, but I, I think uh, we'll see more and more augmentation of in, in person care with telemedicine. Um, one of the biggest hurdles is regulation. Um, you know, um, prior to the pandemic, you know, a provider ha had to be licensed in the state or the country where the, the, the person patient was located at the time of consultation or time of service. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that, that was, um, a little bit, uh, relaxed during the pandemic in some states, <laughs> um, but you have to be careful because it, it is a, 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 a an offense in, in state and if, if you don't do it properly um you know uh you know practicing without a license is a major offense um and you know one of the challenges especially in the states we've got you know 50 states plus dc which has its own medical board and then you you know we're not even talking about the, the territories like puerto rico which also have its own medical board um and you know each of these medical boards have you know also also have uh, interactions with their legislative bodies uh, the, 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 you know, the Senate and the House in each, you know, uh, in each of the states, you know, dr drafting legislation and things like that. So it's almost a full time job, job to keep up with all the regulations. Um, now, let me shift gear a little bit to clinical trials. Um, j just like, you know, just like uh, conventional practice, uh, clinical trials have been forced to go virtual. Um, talk a little bit about that, a little bit why, um, you know, in person or centralized. I mean, up until recently, that was a big thing. Uh, you know, um, it was limited by you know, uh, patients had to be within driving distance or had to like book a hotel at a clinic site in order to participate. Uh, that caused a big inconvenience, high overhead. And of course, we saw that almost all in-person clinical trials shut down during the beginning of the pandemic. Some of them never got started again. Um, so you had massive layoffs of, of clinical trial staff and, and you know, just just large amount of resource losses because you know um, you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't operate a clinical trial during the pandemic, um, and so a lot of a lot of uh, clinical trials are scrambling to move more towards decentralized virtual as much as they can. Uh, it is pandemic resistance, but it does have its own limitations. Uh, like you can't take a muscle biopsy, for example, virtually. Uh, that that's something that that needs to be done in person. Uh, but you know there are. And, and you know, for for some clinical trials, uh, that's that's not an issue. Um, you can still do most of what what you want to do uh, by a virtual clinical trial if if you plan it and have the right uh, resources aboard. Um, now let's uh, switch gear here to to longevity itself. Um, our, you know, the famous Arbery Gray, he's, he uh, says that there's no difference between saving lives and extending lives, because in both cases, we are giving people the chance of more life. Uh, and the reason I bring this quote up is because people say, why, you know, why focus on extending life? You know, we should be saving lives, you know, curing diseases, um, you know, things like that. And, and, and this, just, this quote just kind of highlights perfectly uh, why you need to be both, uh, extend life and save lives. And, and they're kind of two, almost two sides of the same coin. Uh, what is longevity? Um, it depends on who you ask, um, but it's not ba basically it's not the number of candles on your birthday cake. It's how you feel and how you um, and, and how you function um, as as you get older. Um, you know, um, if, you know, if you ask people if they want to live to 120, they will no. Um, uh, you know, because they think that you know 120 means that you know you, you know you're you're frail and and and, and very ill. Uh, but if you ask them, you know, if you want to be 120 but still be as healthy as you are today, you know, everybody will say, yeah, of course, almost everybody. Um, so basically, it's biohacking to um, uh, you know, it's basically biohacking your way to um, uh, to longer and healthier life. 
Um, we've come to realize that premature aging is the ultimate cause of chronic disease. And that's kind of where my passion in medicine lies ever since medical school. Um, you're looking for the root cause. Why longevity? Um, you know, um, curing diseases is, you know, um, somebody likened it to, to the game of whack-a-mole. If you've ever been to a carnival, you kind of hit one one mole and the other one pops up, you hit it and then the other one pops up. So same same type of concept. Uh, you know, um, the one, one statistic that really uh, blew my mind was, you know, if, if you were to somehow magically cure cancer completely, um, that would only add about three life, three years to life expectancy. Um, and that's, of course, if you cure cancer by not treating the underlying uh, causes of cancer, you know, just somehow, you know, poof, cancer is gone. The reason is because, you know, these are these are all the um, uh, diseases that are common as you get older. Uh, and the reason is, you know, if cancer doesn't get you, heart disease is right behind it, stroke, you know, pneumonia, diabetes, all right behind it. Um, so so it's just a matter of, um, like I said, whack-a-mole, you, you whack cancer and all of a sudden heart disease gets you. Um, so you really, that, that kind of highlights the need for uh, treating the underlying processes of disease, which which is premature aging. Now, um, how do you go about doing that? Um, there was a, uh, in 2013, there was considered to be a, a very important um, article that came out uh, introducing the concept of the hallmarks of aging. Um, the, the authors of the, uh, the article talked about nine hallmarks of aging. Now there's some debate, you know, how useful these hallmarks are, you know, are there nine or are there 12? Um, I mean, they have, the details are not very, are not terribly important. Uh, it's the concept of it. The, and the concept is that, you know, um, you know, as you get older, um, you know, more and more of these things go wrong and, you know, pretty much all diseases, all chronic diseases can be linked back to one or more of these. Uh, and the important takeaway concept of the paper was uh, you need to have a multi-faceted uh, approach uh, multimodal, multifaceted approach to to addressing uh, more than one at a time. If you just address one, you're never really going to get anywhere because you know the other eight will, will get you. So you really need really need to address at least probably half of them. We're not sure how many yet. Um, that's still kind of a work in progress. I mean, this is all still new. 2013. I mean, that was that that's 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 nothing in terms of um, um, you know in, in terms of the you know uh, uh, timeline. That's, that's only eight, seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, so we're still working out all the details. Uh, but but like I said, the foundation was was uh, put in place. Um, just uh, briefly talking about you know longevity therapies. What's available today? Um, you know you have. We, we try to avoid the word anti-aging, and well, I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute here, and, and try to focus on the word longevity or health span. Um, you know, conventional anti-aging, you know, when, when people talk about anti-aging, I mean, they, they meet, there, there are different meanings to it, uh, but the most common meaning to it these days is things like, you know, Botox, fillers, hormone replacement, sexual health, um, you know, kind of almost, I would say, narrow focus. Um, I mean, it's all well and good, but um, but uh, it's not it's not what I'm, particularly passionate about. Um, longevity, on the other hand, is, is, is using therapies um, to extend health span, um, almost from the inside out. Um, you know, uh, you have, you have all, all sorts of therapies, again, going back to the hallmarks of aging. Uh, it's it's going to take, you know, there's not going to be, I don't think we'll ever find one therapy that'll address all nine hallmarks. Um, and, and so that's, uh, it's becoming more and more evident that we need, we need a multi-treatment approach. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, metformin, analytics, mTOR inhibitors, uh, you know, reducing inflammation. Um, and then, um, again, you know, uh, just talk a little bit about uh, what's available today uh, versus kind of what we're trying to develop, uh, you know, brick and mortar, uh, you know, even, even for the, you know, great longevity clinics out there, you know, typically, um, uh, you know, limited geographic reach, um, you know, uh, you know, there's not always a, a method of data collection. You know, you end up with silos of care. Um, however, if you if you do it online and kind of a coordinated effort, um, you know, there's no drug effort, uh, limitations theoretically. I mean, kind of once you start, once you get once you get beyond the regulations, obviously, and then you know, allow you to kind of uh, gather data and provide more consistent quality uh, of, of uh, care um, and, and improvement. So let me introduce Aegis RX. Uh, we uh, launched October 2019. Uh, we were first called Qualitude. So if, you, if you Google that name, Quality stands for Quality Adjusted Life Years. A little bit nerdy. Um, that's my fault. Um, and uh, we were lucky to be picked up by CNBC um, when we first launched. 
you can you can pull up that article on CNBC if you'd like to read it. Um, and we started out with Metformin, kind of our, and it's still considered to be kind of our flagship product. Um, there's there's so much great science about it, and every day it seems like I'm reading an article. I just read an article last month or two months ago about you know people on Metformin had reduced incidence of uh, macular degeneration. Of course, the problem is one of the problems is you know we're not sure cause and effect yet. But there's more and more evidence piling up that it, that it's, you know the metformin that seems to be having protective mechanism, and you know here's here's one um, uh, here's a, um, a an image that I pulled we pulled from a from a paper that kind of talks about all the potential pathways that metformin um, could be acting on to have such a wide array of um, uh, of benefits. Uh, currently, we're um, you know we're we're a telemedicine offering. Um, and uh, we're launching some clinical trials. I'll talk about that a little bit more. And uh, we also are getting into like a personal data analysis. Um, I'm not sure what the right wording for this is, to be honest. Um, uh, but I'll talk a little bit more in, in, the, uh, in, in the upcoming slides here. Um, <clears throat> you know, we currently offer metformin, NAD, glutathione is kind of a new offering. Um, and uh, coming up, um, you know, we're providing some solutions for hair loss. Because that's again a big big issue when you're uh, getting older, uh, and uh, nutraceuticals. Um, you know, um, we we've you know the science is is very promising on, on natural products as well, in addition to pharmaceutical. Um, here, you know, here are the nine hallmarks of aging, and uh, you know, um, for 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 some of the hallmarks, we we don't currently have any good treatment for them, uh, like. Well, at least us at Asia Rx. I mean, there might be some out there, uh, but this is just kind of focusing on what Asia Rx is offering. So you can see like metformin, you'll see it in genetic instability, epigenetic alterations, uh, and, you know, nutrient sensing, um, you know, and, and for example, cellular senescence. So you can see, met, you know, metformin hits s several of these. Uh, and then you add on, for example, NAD, and there are some overlap, but there are also some unique qualities to it. Um, and as we um, start offering things like nutraceuticals, we're kind of hip, hoping, hoping to be able to hit more of these uh, hallmarks of aging. Again, you really do need to start, you know, patching each of these holes up uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce uh, premature aging. Um, you know, uh, our goal is to have some kind of personalized data analysis. Uh, we're going to, our plan is to, you know, start uh, collecting biomarkers, perhaps wearable data, um, you know, analyzing using machine learning. This is all coming hopefully in the next 12 to 24 months. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. Um, so, so please bear with us while we're trying to uh, work, work, work all these details out, partnerships, things like that. And the whole, the whole idea is we want to provide actionable insights and monitoring for patients. Um, and we actually just took our first step this last week, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, but before I do that, I mean, I mean, like one of the one of the one of the more uh, recognized biomarkers is the, the DNA methylation clock, made famous by uh, Steve Horvath at uh, UCLA. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that um, you know our DNA has methylation patterns on it, um, and uh, you know methylation is involved in cell differentiation, you know genetic. Uh, functioning. There's, there's a lot of things we're, we're discovering about methylation patterns. Um, and the decay uh, of these methylation patterns leads to a loss of cell function, differentiation, gene expression. Uh, and so by measuring the uh, methylation patterns and running it through sophisticated algorithms, um, it, it's become one of the more potent um, uh, aging clock. It's not an end-all be-all, um, but that's a different <laughs> lecture for a different day. Uh, I, I could spend an hour just talking about the different bio clocks and, and, and biomarkers and things like that. Um, so we just launched our personalized wellness assessment in HSRX. Um, you know, it, it takes into consideration your dietary choice, your sleep habit, activity, uh, and we try to provide a uh, as accurate as we can right now a snapshot of overall longevity and wellness. And then, um, uh, you know, based on the latest and greatest research, we try to, uh, you know, give recommendations for patients of what we think, based on their inputs, what we think uh, will be beneficial to them. Um, so, if, so if you go, go if you go to our website and you take the quiz, currently you'll get a score. You know, you'll get an overall score, aggregate, kind of an aggregate score, longevity score, based on you know diet, sleep, and exercise. In the future, um, don't know when yet, because um, it's 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 a, it's a big undertaking. Like I said, we're hoping to like give you you know an immune score, cardiovascular score, you know maybe even like a cancer risk score, uh, based on, on on a variety of different markers. We're we're still working out the details, um, and and you know talking to various different partners and things like that. So, but the idea is that you know um, we'll give you a, a, a hoping to give patients a longevity score. Um, and um, the idea is actionable insights to improve the score, whether it's lifestyle, nutraceuticals, prescription, um, and allows you to track over time. 
almost like a credit score. Those people who live in the States, there's a FICO score. It's almost like that. Um, all right, just a few minutes here on rapamycin. And I'm sorry, clinical trials. I know, I know, I've been a little long here, uh, but uh, you know, we we, um, we we just launched our, our rapamycin clinical trial. I'll talk about that in a second here. But we're also looking at other um, uh, small scale clinical trials. Basically, patients who come to us for metformin, we're trying to figure out w what we can monitor for those patients to help us build that assessment tool we were I talked about earlier. Um, and so we're taking the steps to do that right now. Uh, and then, you know, in the future that allows us to kind of uh, look at various different combinations uh, and monitor people over time uh, and, and try to pick out um, data points and, 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 and insights and things like that, uh, where you can only get from a large data set. Um, the pro rapamycin trial, you know, if you want to learn more, you can go to our website for it. But basically, it's the largest interventional trial focused on longevity for metformin. We'll be looking at four different dosing protocols, randomized, placebo controlled. Um, Again, I encourage you to go to the website. If you want to learn more, go to the website. There's a there's a, a video that's an hour long, talks about the whole trial. Um, and that kind of highlights the what we're trying to do also at HSRX in terms of clinical trials. So we're trying to we're trying to shift from the old model, the old paradigm, where you know, where where we move away from, you know, new shiny molecules, you know, to um, you know, to, to repurposing, um, you know, uh, very expensive, you know, $2 billion per drug to, to you know, fairly inexpensive uh, therapies and clinical trials. Um, and of course, you know, once, once these new molecules get through all that testing and, and very high failure rates, you know, you end up with very high uh, drug cost. And, you know, and, and again, it's just one therapy and, and one therapy is not going to be an answer to longevity. Um, so that's kind of, we're focusing on more right now, repurposing, uh, medications, uh, nutraceuticals, other kind of therapies that are available and encourages uh, participation from citizen scientists. Um, now, uh, we're, we started out with the, the PURL, that's kind of our largest clinical trial currently, uh, and that'll allow us to um, build a platform, the research platform to start looking at other therapies as well. Uh, and, and one day we'll, we hope to be able to offer rapamycin as a, as a treatment like we are metformin. Right now, there's not just not enough known about it uh, to offer it as a prescription. Um, you know, those, those who are interested in, in assisting us, uh, you know, if, if, if it's something research related, you can contact research at HSRX. Um, you know, um, we we launched um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we launched a, a crowdfunding thanks to the help of uh, um, Leaf Lifespan.io. Um, very well reception. You know, we raised uh, about $110,000 just in the first couple of weeks. Um, and we, we've exceeded our initial goal. Uh, but the more we raise, the more sophisticated testing we can offer um, for the uh, rapamycin trial. Uh, anybody interested in learning more, uh, there's a video here. Again, our, our, Pearl, our, our, our website contains uh, uh, information about it as well. Um, so where, where are we one year later? So like I said, I gave this presentation a year ago. And, uh, you know, we continue to have strong, you know, 20 to 30% month on month growth. We went from, I think, about 1,500 last year active subscriber up to over 6,000, you know, well on our way to about 10,000 probably by by the end of the quarter. Um, you know, um, we, have, we, we continue to, you know, have attractive customer acquisition costs. Uh, we find, you know, we closed a, a seed round oversubscribed <laughs> with with to turn away some investors. Sorry about that. Uh, but we're looking to uh, raise perhaps a series A um, in the next maybe six to nine months, uh, maybe 12 months, depending on how, how, what our needs are and how we do and, and, and how some of the, you know, potential challenges that we might face. Um, all right. Um, thanks for taking the time to listen. I apologize if I went over time. Again, apologize for speaking a little bit quickly. And um, if you have any questions, uh, like to get a hold of me, it's uh, Dr. Zalzala at hsrx.com.